Mount Hospitals, European Military Theory, the Environment, and Mountain Warfare in Appalachia. On November 3rd, 1863, members of Ambrose Burnside's 23rd Corps entered Knoxville, Tennessee, capturing two locomotives and a number of cars and a very considerable amount of Army stores. The attempt by Union Brigadier General George Washington Morgan to invade East Tennessee the previous year failed. Morgan's attempt resulted in his division becoming nearly trapped at Cumberland Gap, cut off from the rest of East Tennessee by the Confederate forces around the countryside. This paper explains why Burnside's attempt succeeded by arguing that he utilized European tactics for conducting mountain warfare found in the works of the Swiss military theorist Baron de Germany and Prussian general and military theorist Karl von Clausewitz. Those European military principles allowed the Union commander to overcome the environment of Appalachia. Some of the most acclaimed monographs related to strategy and tactics in the Civil War point to Johnny as the greatest influence on the war's conduct. As James W. Paul put it, the consensus of opinion of what can fairly be called the American School of Military Historians is that by following the doctrines of Johnny, the commanders were influenced for ill. However, more recent scholarship challenges that argument and diminishes the role of Johnny played. This revision claims that the conclusions drawn about the Swiss military theorists became justifications to oversimplify quite complex intellectual processes and seek to restore him to his pro proper place, one in which he presents a single, though admittedly strong voice among a mass of military authors whose ideas became available to the Civil War generation. This paper agrees with that statement and likewise asserts that multiple theorists and authors contributed to the intellectual discussions of military matters. Cadets and their teachers gathered knowledge from a host of writers and used that information to make war. But one can draw parallels between Johnny and Clausewitzian military principles and the strategies used by Civil War commanders in their efforts to engage in mountain warfare. Johnny suggested for offensive commanders to divide their commands into smaller units. To maneuver through the mountains, the concentration of forces becomes more difficult in the mountains because of the need for an army to guard multiple routes within a mountain range. John Lee suggests to make demonstrations upon the whole line of the enemy in order to lead the enemy to extend his defense and then force passage at the point which promises the greatest results. To further his point, he stated that if there, is, if there be five or six roads on a menaced front, they should all, of course, be threatened. By doing this, it prevents the enemy from concentrating their forces as well. This theory focused on offensive movements in valleys and mountain, mountainous regions to draw the enemy into a battle, hopefully unconcentrated. In his discussion of mountain warfare, John Lee focused a large amount of attention on maneuvering in valleys and urged commanders to fight the enemy in valleys if at all possible. The theorist's strategy of choice relied on use of the valley walls as a barrier in order to trap the enemy and limit their mobility. By using repeated assaults on the enemy in, in that limited space, a commander forced direct and restricted, a forced and restricted line of retreat. By restricting the line of retreat of the enemy, one increased the odds of capturing or demolishing the entire force and gaining complete victory. However, an army's mobility remained at the center of this blueprint for success. Although Clausewitz called offensive maneuvers in mountains and a necessary evil, he offered advice for commanders who needed to engage in such an action and listed the advantages on the side of the attacker. An army on the offensive retained the advantage of choosing the field of battle. If the enemy occupied a gap or pass, the attacker may go through another low point and flank the opposing army. Set up a strong defense, but takes time, thus the defender would struggle to fortify every route possible. Commanders should divide their forces, just like John Lee says, but not too small to hinder unifying the force in case of an attack and use multiple roads. Mountain roads in general prevent units from widening their columns of march to speed up their movements, assigning divisions of the army to different routes in close proximity to one another ensure that a surprise attack could not single out one group without the others coming to reinforce them. Once the army engages in pitched combat, Clausewitz advised military commanders to concentrate one's forces and achieve victory by bursting through the enemy's line and separating the wings rather than surrounding the force and so cutting it off. 
The broken enemy may, be, may put up resistance on the retreat, but if the aggressor attacked the line of retreat, the resistance would remain minimal. Union General Ambrose Burnside's campaign to capture East Tennessee mimicked these principles suggested by John A. Clausewitz. At the beginning of his march, Burnside, Burnside's 8,400 man force split into four sections. Entering the, Cumberland, entering, the Cumberland, entering the Cumberland Plateau at four different locations covering a front about 90 miles wide from Jamestown, Tennessee to the Cumberland Gap. Historian Earl Hess has estimated that Burnside's forces told 8,400 men, about half of whom were cavalry or mounted infantry. The Union Corps commander targeted two locations, Knoxville, Tennessee, one of the large cities in East Tennessee, and headquarters of the Confederate Department of East Tennessee, and Cumberland Gap, the largest garrison of Confederates in the north, in the region north of Chattanooga. The organization and the march minimized the problem of gathering food along the way, making this a much more efficient way of marching into and through Appalachia. By dividing his corps, Burnside could live off the little forage that the surrounding area afforded, but depended on a quicker moving baggage train for the majority of their food. Union troops raided patches of corn to get roasting ears for themselves and fodder for their mules. One soldier of Burnside's corps did not address one hungry at any point in the campaign, but did mention the difficulty of marching over mountains during which he hurt his foot. Of course, Burnside entered East Tennessee when most Confederate forces gathered around Chattanooga to defend against the offensive operations of William S. Rosecrans's Army of the Cumberland. Still, from a logistical standpoint, Burnside's strategy worked extremely well. Although Burnside mounted a large portion of his corps, the rugged and barren terrain still preyed upon the blue troops, but the quicker movements and dispersed march made Appalachia's obstacles more manageable. The columns moved out on August 20, 1873. Some of the most difficult terrain came after they crossed the Cumberland River. One soldier commented, we crossed the Cumberland River quite a swift and wide stream, and where we forded about two or in two and a half or three feet deep, and we saw the rock bottom, and, and covered over with loose stones, the water was very clear, but here it seems as though our hard work had just begun. The southern bank of the river forced them to climb a hill that was very near a mile and a half long, and in some places so steep, rocky, and crooked that it took almost impossible, it looked almost impossible to get up all the way. Once on the south side of the bank, such a road as we, he states, on the south side of the bank, such a road as we came over, I never heard of before, nor never want to hear of again. I don't believe there is another such road in the Confederacy. If there is, it ought to be blocked up forever. <laughs> the divisions brought extra mules and horses to pull wagons, artillery, and caissons over the steep mountainsides. Depending on the weight of the load, anywhere from four to twelve horses or mules were required, with the additional help of manpower to climb the inclines and ease down the declines. The lack of forage still plagued this invasion force, like the previous attempts to invade East Tennessee. The increased beast of burden resulted in each column of troops extending their search for full fodder miles away from the designated route, but the spread out nature of the march, designed by Burnside, made it so that each group did not interfere with the movements of each other. Men of the 23rd Corps saw that mountaineers lived in little log huts and found the people in the mountains very poor and made more so by the rebels crossing and taking everything they had it was nearly impossible for us to get forage for the amount of mules and horses that we had with us. Additionally, the men too were on short rations some of the times, but roasting ears and apples were plenty compensated in measure for their short rations. Burnside knew that if his troops could pass into the fertile region of the Ridge Valley region of Appalachia and capture Knoxville, that supplies could reach them by rail from Nashville. So he gambled that the little forage available would sustain his men on their quick movement through the Cumberland Plateau. Despite the continued lack of forage and the struggle to maneuver large pieces of artillery and wagons over the slopes, the soldiers who invaded the region got along very well indeed, as one soldier said. Some columns made it out of the barren plateau in just six days, prompting one soldier to comment it was quite comfortable travel. The mountain forces quickly traversed the mountains of southeastern Kentucky and thus overcame the terrain's difficulties before the environment whittled away their numbers. 
Burnside's mobility in Appalachia led to his success, which John Lee Burnside's professor at West Point, Dennis Hart Mahan, emphasized as the key to operate in the mountains. John Lee's military principles permeated the writings of Mahan, who taught Burnside and many of the West Pointers training, uh, West Point trained commanders of the Civil War. Beginning in 1831, Mahan taught at West Point for 40 years and instructed many, if not most, of the profession, uh, professionally trained commanders of the Civil War. He became one of the nation's leading war theorists and is responsible for organizing military education by providing theory and then giving the best practical application of those theories. Furthermore, Mahan produced two textbooks for West Point classes. His incredible career at the United States Military Academy arguably, arguably makes him one of the most influential men in American military history based on the multitude of students he trained that became Civil War leaders. Historian John F. Marzalak commented that Mahan drew inspiration from the works of Jomini and owed an enormous intellectual debt to the Swiss theorist. Therefore, his classes, at the very least, indirectly taught cadets Jomini in principles. Mahan offered guidance on the, on the composition of an army involved in mountain warfare. Because of the undulating terrain, made cavalry charges difficult and nearly impossible in some cases, those units should follow behind the main body, allowing infantry skirmishers to act as the advance guard against threats. Dragoons, on the other hand, riding in front of columns and dismounting to file on foot, utilized the mobility of cavalry and the striking power of infantry. Therefore, dragoons posed a unique opportunity for commanders to fight back against the hindrances posed by the rough, rough, rough ground that slowed down infantry. The landscape created many advantages and disadvantages for artillery. Although high ground bolstered the effective range of the cannons, the struggle to place them in ridges and peaks kept them from a, from a predominant role in the mountains. Artillery crews who would strain to move batteries of heavy artillery to a location overlooking a battlefield. But my hand observed the usefulness of light artillery. Its weight made it perfect for traversing the steep slopes without straining the men and horses of the crew too much and, and once in position, could lock shells at a considerable distance on unsuspecting foes. Heavy artillery had a place in Mahan's mountain warfare tactics, but he suggested commanders use them for battering down earthworks of the enemy guarding a critical gap or pass. He, did, uh, he not only designated the role of infantry, cavalry, and artillery in mountain warfare, he also designated the role of, our, uh, engineer, of the engineer corps. Enemy entrenchments included abatis, chevaux de frise, and other obstacles. Therefore, a detachment of engineer troops should accompany each column to clear away the obstructions. Each part of the army needed the ability to nullify obstructions to preserve the army's mobility. John Lee also emphasized the benefits of using citizens of mountainous regions as a useful tool in warfare, in mountain warfare to be specific. With an army consisting of soldiers not from the mountains, local scouts could greatly aid commanders with intimate knowledge of the terrain. With their help, particularly in defensive situations, a disciplined force might hold its own against triple its number, triple number. However, he does offer a caveat. Defense of such areas would be the easiest if all its inhabitants were united in spirit. Throughout the chapter on mountain warfare, he warned about the ability of small bands of soldiers to harass larger forces, and if dissent existed with the citizenry of the area, they could act as guerrillas. Hit and run tactics could strain armies and their supplies by depriving them of security and foodstuffs. The ultimate, uh, this ultimately goes back to his insistence that an army commander stay in the open in order to avoid such, such attacks and situations. The loyalty of the Mountaineers thus could impede or progress a, a campaign. It is my hand approached the use of Mountaineers in much the same way that John Lee did. Because mountains prevented commanders from being able to view wide expanses of the landscape, my hand explained that the use of a trusty guide familiar with the area became more essential for planning movements in mountains. Ravines, hollers, and sharp defiles could mean disaster for an army, but a local guide or scout helped prevent that from happening. The advocacy for local assistance correlates with the assigning with assigning commanders from mountainous regions as the best strategy for success, for success based on that commander's knowledge of the terrain. Additionally, commanders with prior experience in mountain warfare contribute valuable knowledge to the mountain expeditions and campaigns. 
Burnside benefited from the Unionist sympathies of loyal East Tennesseans and from commanders familiar with mountain warfare. When Burnside invaded East Tennessee, he did so with three of the four divisions available to him in the 23rd Corps. Brigadier General Samuel Powhatan Carter commanded one of these divisions. Additionally, Burnside organized a brigade of men under Colonel John F. Corsi to advance on Cumberland Gap, the furthest eastern column of the invasion. Carter led a reconnaissance mission involving Corsi in March of 1862 to test the fortifications of Cumberland Gap. Carter also commanded a brigade in, the, in Brigadier General George Washington Morgan's 7th Division of the Army of Ohio during the first capture of the Cumberland Gap in June of 1862. Furthermore, he is the only American officer to achieve the ranks of Major General in the Army and Rear Admiral in the Navy at the same time. Carter hailed from Elizabeth to the in East Tennessee. His Appalachian roots and the fact that he grew up in East Tennessee, not far from the Cumberland Gap in Knoxville, made Carter a wise choice. His, ser his service in southeastern Kentucky and East Tennessee from the beginning of the war until August of 1863, when he joined Burnside, gave him experience in mountain warfare. De Corsi, a British-born soldier who fought in the Crimean War, served under Carter during East, the East Tennessee and First Constance Mission to Cumberland Gap, as well as commanded a brigade under Morgan. Both men supplied the 23rd Corps with critical knowledge about Appalachia and the Kentucky-Tennessee border region. The use of mountaineers and those accustomed to mountain warfare led to significant numbers of his troops uh, through rugged the use of mountaineers and those accustomed to mountain warfare to lead significant numbers of his troops through the rugged terrain of southeastern Kentucky and into East Tennessee mimic one of John Lee's, not John Lee's principles for operating in the mountains. In conclusion, Ambrose Burnside's East Tennessee campaign embodied the military principles outlined in John Lee and Klaus Spitz's uh, teachings on mountain warfare. Most likely, Burnside and many Civil War leaders became influenced by John Lee's works directly or indirectly through their time at West Point, and those ways of waging war manifested themselves in the Civil War. Burnside mounted his invasion force, which allowed him to traverse the rugged terrain of the Appalachian Mountains quicker than infantry moving by foot. Previous invasions failed because of a lack of forage, but the quick movement 23rd Corps could carry or forage off the land for the short duration they remained in the barren parts of the mountains. John Lee suggested for commanders to use that style of organization in his seminal work, and he advised military leaders to utilize the mountaineers in their maneuverings. Burnside used the mountaineers to command one of his divisions, and a colonel familiar with mountain warfare to lead a brigade on his successful invasion and capture of East Tennessee. The East Tennessee campaign displayed John Lee principles in the way of fighting war in mountainous terrain, and the success of Burnside demonstrated its effectiveness. Thank you.